Welcome back to New Rockstars. This is The Big Question. It's the show that gives you too much information about how much the Marvel heroes hate each other's guts. Did I do that? <laughs> I'm Eric Voss, filling in for Phil this week, our friend Tommy Bechtold. Yes. How you doing, buddy? Great to be here. Happy to be here. Thanks for uh, having me, Eric. Can you tell us where Philip is buried? Philip is, he's not buried, he's melting in a vat of acid. Oh, so I've been digging under that septic tank, and <laughs> You'll just find Carol Baskin's chase. husband. You will not find <sighs> Philip. You will find <sighs> Philip in my new product of hand soaps and lotions and hair gels that come out. Fill me ups. Uh, you see, I have a total conspiracy that Philip is Carol Baskin's ex-husband, because <laughs> we don't know how old he is. So, yeah, a couple days ago, we just did our re-breakdown of Captain America Civil War, and we love the movie, but mm. as we know from the Marvel comics, Civil War is a way bigger deal, and now we're in an MCU that has pretty much everyone involved. Gang's all here, yeah. So hit me with that question, Tom. Okay, so my question for you, Eric, is what would a true MCU Civil War look like now that Marvel has all of their heroes uh, available to them? Let's recap here. Yeah, in the MCU, Captain America Civil War was based on the Civil War event in the comics, and uh, the Sokovia Accords were like a form of the superhero oversight and registration, the Superhero Registration Act, as it's known in the comics. Mm. So in the movie, Team Iron Man, who's pro Sokovia Accords, mm. includes Tony Stark, Rhodey, Black Panther, Vision, Spider-Man, and Black Widow, though Natasha changes sides during the airport battle uh, to be on Team Cap. Team Cap, who's anti-accords, Captain America, Bucky, Falcon, Hawkeye, Wanda Maximoff, and Ant-Man. So, as we know in the film, it's not as much about the accords by the end of the movie. It's it's more personal. The Tony hates Bucky because Bucky killed his parents, mm -hmm. and he blames Cap for defending him. T'Challa hates Bucky for he thinks is involved in his father's killing. Uh, Wanda never trusts Tony. Rhodey gets critically injured. That makes it super personal. Vision misfires at, at mm -hmm. Team Cap. By the end of the movie, it's not about the accords. It's just Zemo manipulating the Avengers against yes. each other. <laughs> The way Tommy is manipulating me and Philip against each other. That's right. The way I've used Marina and Joven <laughs> and all of the other non-Philip and Eric characters <laughs> as pawns in my game. The sad part is we know what you're doing, Tommy. We're just powerless to stop you. Who's that? In the comics, uh, Civil War is obviously a way bigger deal. Involves pretty much all the Marvel Universe. It starts when a superhero fight blows up 600 people in Connecticut. Yes. 60 kids die. Yeah. The public turns against superheroes. They demand the Superhero Registration Act. It passes. The X-Men declare neutrality. They're like, we don't want to pick a side in this because either way, it's lose-lose for us. Mm -hmm. Iron Man leads the pro-registration side. Cap leads the anti-registration side. Spider-Man starts off with Team Iron Man. Mm -hmm. He outs himself. Big press conference. Big deal. But then later, by the end of the war, he switches sides to Cap. He's horrified by the enforcement things that they're, that they're pulling. Tony and Reed Richards bring in this, what people think is Thor, but really it's like a clone of Thor that is called Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. It kills Bill Foster, Goliath, a yes. uh, big, big moment. And then the war ends with Cap surrendering, but he gets assassinated. Huge moment in Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. So let's apply this to the MCU now with all the characters who are there. All yes. the characters who did not appear in the Civil War film, which side would they be on? And since we don't really know, we're going to use some standards here. First standard, how their character cited in the comics. Mm -hmm. Two, what their longtime alliances are with other characters. Three, their general attachment to Earth's politics and laws. Do they care? Right. Uh, four, their general moral alignment. We're going to apply some D&D gridding here. And then five, whether they wear a mask. Because as we saw in the Civil War event, they're, whether or not they're a public superhero uh, is, a, is a big part of it. Do they want to reveal themselves, reveal their real name to this public oversight? Or are they just like, uh, whatever, everyone knows who I am anyway. Mm. Uh, you can learn a lot by someone by whether they wear a mask. Especially now more than ever. Tommy, will you please wear a mask when you go outside? I always wear a mask. I've been wearing masks for years. People used to beg <laughs> me not to. Now they demand that I do. 
Out of the game as usual. How do you see these things coming? You must have been involved. Were you part of that chemtrail conspiracy, Tommy? Well, what happened is I have an orb in my basement that talks to me. It commands me to do things, and occasionally, if I do its bidding, it will reward me with little glimpses into the future. For instance, Eric, I wouldn't get sushi next week. Oh, shit. Why? Why? Tommy, tell me! Tommy tells. <laughs> Tommy tells is your new show, right? <laughs> Tommy tells. <laughs> Nostra Thomas. <laughs> okay, first character, Hulk. Bruce Banner, right? Yes. He was on Sakaar during Civil War. In the comics, he was also off-world during this event. He wasn't really involved. Mm -hmm. But when asked about it in an interview, Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans, Joe Russo, they all weighed in. Evans said that Banner would be on Team Iron Man because Natasha was on that team at the beginning. Oh, yeah. Joe Russo said that Banner would never side with Thaddeus Ross because that was his main antagonist in the first Hulk film. Mm -hmm. But Robert Downey Jr. said that Banner and Tony are science dudes. And mm -hmm. I side with Robert Downey Jr. Banner has a profound sense of responsibility and guilt over his collateral damage. Mm -hmm. He would definitely agree with the Sokovia Accord. So I say, Hulk, Team Iron Man. Yeah, he's amongst the more reluctant heroes, right? Not, yes. not that he's reluctant to commit heroic acts, but that he's reluctant to exist in general. Yeah. Like, he doesn't... He, he feels as though he's a burden on everyone, and, and unfortunately through literally means beyond his control, he often is a burden on everyone because of the destruction caused as the Hulk. So I can't see him fighting against it. I feel like you're 100% correct. Yeah. Uh, moving on to Thor. Okay, so Thor was also off-world during the event. He was exploring the Nine Realms. Said he was seeking the stones, but that wasn't really the case. Uh, in the comics, he was also off-world, but yeah, as I said, there was like a Thor clone that was involved. Chris Evans said that Thor would be on Team Cap, and in the MCU, Thor's really not that concerned with the politics of Earth. Um, he probably would not, he's a demigod, he wouldn't concede to their oversight. Uh, but I also just don't think he would be opinionated enough to fight his fellow Avengers. So I would say, I would label Thor as neutral to this conflict. And I would also throw in most of the Asgardians, uh, Valkyrie and their friends Korg and Meek, Heimdall. I think whether they're off-world or whether this is later in the timeline where they're on new Asgard on Earth, I, I think they would say, uh, we're neutral to this, you guys figure it out, we're not gonna uh, turn our, our fists against each other in this. Yeah, I think the subservience part is the ludicrous part that he would they would never go for. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I can't see any of the Asgardians walking in with their hands in cuffs and, or voluntarily registering to be monitored by, by any sort of Earth government. One Asgardian who has volunteered his hands to be in cuffs is Loki. So, oh, yes. you know, Loki is both alive and dead at the same time yes, these days in the point. MCU. But he is definitely uninterested in political squabbles unless they could benefit his yeah. goals. This guy's a master of Machiavellian. Yeah. Uh, so... I would imagine him seeing these Sokovia Accords as making Earth's superheroes more controllable and mm -hmm. easier to manipulate and conquer. So I could see Loki trying to game this and join Team Iron Man in a mm. Civil War conflict. That would be very interesting and very funny, like watching Loki meddle in government affairs like that. And basically, whatever his end goal was, which is always something that's, I mean, like, it's always something absolutely epic in scale of, like, total, he wants to be the absolute authoritarian leader. Or it's like... He wants a snack. It's like there's no in-between. It's either something incredibly <laughs> huge or something like he was bored that day. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Captain Marvel. So during the Civil War event, Carol Danvers was then known as Miss Marvel, and she supported registration. She was on Team Iron Man. However, the Carol Danvers in the MCU is based on the 2011 relaunch of the character. That MCU identity is more aggressive and stubborn. She goes her own way. She defies orders. She also has had some bad experience with, like, conspiracies and gaslighting by the Kree's supreme intelligence. She doesn't trust higher authorities. I would think she would agree that the safest hands are her own, and she would probably join Team Cap. Yeah, that's kind of another, like, I think Steve Rogers taking the stance that he did was kind of a swerve. Like, Carol Danvers is, like, you know, she's a soldier. She was in, the, you know, she was in the military, and, like, so you would assume there would be an element of her that would want to fall in line that way. But I think you're right with the rebooted character having kind of a... An attitude like that. Yeah, I think you're like you're dead on with that one again, Eric. Good job. Yes. I am the authority. You <laughs> no disagreement. Or am I just telling you what you want to hear as part of a bigger plot? Loki? I just want an echo chamber yes. of agreeers. <laughs> Me too. Come on. That's why I yeah. go on Twitter. Oh bye. <laughs> Let's quickly check in on Doctor Strange. Yes. He was around during this event, but notice how the ancient one, the other sorcerers, they didn't get involved because they're uh they serve authority that's beyond the laws of man. They would remain neutral as well. They've seen too much. 
stuff in their lives that like when these things happen, they already know how they're like half of them probably have already been to the future and know how it turns out. And they're just like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Just like the, the wizards of the Harry Potter universe, yes. they avoid all political matters, including World War II, which nowadays makes them Nazi sympathizers. That's right. Harry Potter is a tough one to unpack. That is like the, the, the further down the logic rabbit holes you go with that, the more wizards are just monsters. <laughs> They're just yeah. terrible people. They make their poop disappear, too. They just teleport... <laughs> Which we'll be talking more about that subject later, but like there's an element of J.K. Rowling oversharing things about yeah. the Wizarding World of Harry Potter where I'm like, God, I get it. This is your like crazy world that you created that's incredibly creative, but like we don't need closure on everything. We don't no. need answers. There are some questions that the mystery is more fun than the solution. Speaking of mystery, let's move on to Nick Fury. So oh, yes. Nick Fury didn't pick a side during Civil War in the MCU. In the Marvel Companion comics with the movie Civil War, mm -hmm. he and Maria Hill were like kind of watching on with sadness as the Avengers fought each other. They're like, ah, mm -hmm. oh, I wish we could do something. <laughs> um, one would think Nick Fury would be pro Sokovia Accords because he has in the past favored big government control over superheroes. He wants them as a weapon in his arsenal, but we saw in Winter Soldier, he definitely learned that he could no longer trust the government to oversee anything. Right. And Civil War is post Hydra Shield. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I would definitely say Nick Fury would be Team Cap during mm -hmm. uh, a Civil War conflict. Now, along with Nick Fury would probably be characters like Wasp, Janet Van Dyne, and Hank Pym. Now, Hank Pym is uh, usually aligned with Tony Stark, but in the MCU, they're frequent lawbreakers. They say never trust a Stark. So like Scott Lang, they would also be Team Cap. That to me is a hugely valuable swerve to yeah. have them be on Team Cap because the, the just the technology alone that they possess. But. Sure, yeah, they have access to the quantum realm. They can shrink, they can time travel. That's a huge benefit for Team Cap. Now, on to the people of Wakanda. So T'Challa, of course, supports Team Iron Man. And with that would probably be Okoye and Shuri. They're very loyal to T'Challa. However, M'Baku is interesting, right? I would imagine M'Baku would be less willing to consent to this oversight from a foreign authority. He doesn't yeah. even trust the Wakandan throne that much. I would imagine M'Baku would probably side with Team Cap. Now, let's move on to other characters in the MCU, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, the thing about them is the Guardians of the Galaxy that we know were based on the Abnet and Lanning relaunch of the characters in 2008. They weren't really part of the Civil War event. Mm. And I would imagine they don't really give a shit about Earth's politics, so I would imagine they remain neutral, along with everyone else in their world. Characters like the Ravagers, Adam Warlock, Aisha. If they even knew that it happened, they would be neutral. Yeah, if they had cared, they'd be like, so what's going on on Earth? Right. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. we'll just go fly over to Hala, or we'll go over to Xandar, we'll be okay. Right. Let's move on quickly to the characters who we know are upcoming to the MCU, mm -hmm. who are there, and they're gonna be in movies in the next couple years. Yes. Shang-Chi. So in the Civil War comics, Shang-Chi was part of the Heroes for Hire, who are pro-registration, and I would say as an enemy to the Mandarin and the Ten Rings, also enemies to Tony Stark, the MCU Shang-Chi, from what we know about him, would probably be Team Iron Man. The Eternals are coming up. Uh, the Eternals, those assholes have stayed out of everything. Oh, so they're the wizards in Harry Potter. They're the <laughs> yeah. Why would they intervene now? Yeah. Eternals are going to stay neutral and see this out. Now, Blade is an interesting one. We know Mahershala Ali is coming up to play Blade sometime in the future. In the Civil War comics, Blade is, is one of the enforcers who helps hunt down superheroes. He is a monster hunter. Yeah. He likes to kill vampires. Yeah. Uh, I, I would think he would be pro-accords in order to rein in the other vampiric and other demonic entities around mm -hmm. the world he might be team iron man and he's a very tunnel vision superhero he's he he can he can singularly focus the thing that always sways these these heroes morally in the movies and sometimes in the comics is when they 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 have a new element of something to care about whereas blade's kind of yeah. got a singular focus yeah. Blade wouldn't have a philosophical objection to this kind right. of thing. Uh, neither would uh, She-Hulk. Jennifer Walters mm -hmm. is a lawyer. She's out in the public. She doesn't hide her identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's cousins with Bruce Banner. We've considered Bruce to be on Team Iron Man. Mm -hmm. As she is in the comics, I would say she would be Team Iron Man. I love it. She's just Hulk to me. You know, I don't feel the need to gender my Hulks. But uh, I would like her to represent me in the court of love. <laughs> uh, now let's quickly check in with Miss Marvel and Spectrum. Uh, they they seem like they're aligned with Carol Danvers, 
They're very super powered. I would say they probably agree that the safest hands are our own. I would put them on team cap. Uh, and lastly, Uatu the Watcher is technically joined the MCU played by Jeffrey Wright in the Marvel What If show. He is a watcher by definition. They don't intervene. They just observe and record. He is neutral by definition. He has to be. Otherwise, he doesn't get to be the watcher. He's the doer. I'm, I'm a doer. He just likes to watch, kind of like you. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big time watcher, very infrequently a participator, but when I am, it's usually just tickles. Oh boy. Um, all right, now our last category of people are people we know are coming to the MCU, probably the rumored uh, MCU joiners soon. Okay, the Fantastic Four. In the comics, it's interesting, they're split. Reed Richards supports registration, Sue and Johnny are against it, Ben is neutral. I would say in the MCU, uh, applying these things, Reed Richards, he is a man of science and order. He is very much aligned with Tony Stark's way of thinking. He would probably be Team Iron Man, yeah. and I agree. I think Sue Storm and Johnny Storm would probably be Team Cap, mm -hmm. because uh, Sue Storm, in Visible Woman, Johnny Storm, a guy who likes to go his own. Because he is Cap, they're the same character. I can do this all day. Yeah, he started it. I don't know if Ben Grimm would, would stay neutral. I feel like he would pick a side. It's easier to make a neutral choice in a comic where you forget about characters for pages at a time. Uh -huh. It'd be very hard for him to just sit there and be like, I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. I know both sides make relevant points. There's many fine people on both sides of the issue. <laughs> that wouldn't be the Ben Grimm we know. However, Victor Von Doom, uh, he is defined in his like moral alignment as a lawful evil. Mm -hmm. And I could see him joining Team Iron Man as seeing like, mm -hmm. you know what? Registration is the smart way to go. I'm going to use this for evil reasons. Right. But for right now, I'm going to join Mr. Tony Stark in registering everybody and hunting them down. <laughs> okay, we also have gotten pseudo confirmation that Namor might be joining the MCU. He's an original Avenger. And I don't know, in my view, kind of like Black Panther, he's the ruler of a hidden nation. He's a, a man of laws. Uh, and he might benefit from fewer superheroes running around causing chaos in the ocean. Mm -hmm. I would say he might join Team Iron Man. Characters like Nova and Silver Surfer, I kind of lump them in with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Don't yeah. care about Earth's conflicts. Neutral. And uh, let's talk about the mutants. Okay, Civil War was all about the mutants and them running amok because there's so many of them. Cyclops came out and said the X-Men are going to be neutral. Later on, Wolverine and Storm ended up fighting on Team Cap. Bishop ends up supporting superhero registration. In the MCU, we don't really know about the mutants yet. They're kind of an unknown quantity. I would, just running through them quickly, I think Wolverine would be Team Cap. He doesn't want to uh, play yes. by the rules. Go yourself. Cyclops no and Jean Grey and Professor X, I think Team Iron Man. Straight down the line, yes. Magneto would be Team Cap. Yep. I don't think he wants to trust the government. Uh, Rogue, I also think would be Team Cap. She's a rogue. Uh, and yeah, I think Storm and Beast, as people playing within the system, would be on Team Iron Man as well. The Young Avengers, most of them in the comics, uh, Wiccan, Hulkling, Patriot, Kate Bishop, they're on Team Cap because they, they don't trust it. But weirdly, Stature, Cassie Lang, is pro-registration in the comics. And thinking about it, that might make sense. Uh, Cassie Lang, I, I could see her falling far from the tree and supporting Team Iron Man in this kind of conflict. Kids love to rebel against their parents, Eric. I want to rock. <laughs> Let's check in with Deadpool real quick. Uh, in the comics, Deadpool obviously is always like a chaotic neutral. You know, it's whatever the situation calls him to be. But he weirdly is pro-registration as another enforcer like Blade. He tracks down superheroes who are anti-registration and drags them back in. In the MCU, I can imagine a Deadpool wanting to be eager to play by the rules, be accepted by the Avengers, by this universe. So yeah, I can see a version of the Merc with a Mouth being a hunter to endear himself to Tony Stark. So I'm gonna put Deadpool on Team Iron Man for now. Looking at the other defenders, uh, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist. In the comics, they're Team Cap because many of them do have secret identities. Not Luke Cage, but Daredevil obviously still wears a mask. Uh, I, they don't wanna play by those rules. Eddie Brock, Venom, uh, he's kind of at, like Hulk, not totally in control. He, in the comics, is part of Team Iron Man. I think he would be in the, in the movie as well. Okay, so to wrap this all up, in summary, with this new version of all these characters uh, aligned on different sides, Team Iron Man, I think, would have more of an edge. They have She-Hulk, they have Hulk, they have half the mutants. The main difference is the MCU is a place where superheroes generally don't use their secret identities. That was a choice made early on by Kevin Feige and John Favreau and Robert Downey Jr. Characters don't have as much to hide, so they have less to lose by supporting Tony. So I think in general, Team Iron Man would have the edge in the MCU. 
I agree. I think the people that we've named are, yeah, they're just stronger. Yeah, and if you think about it, like, especially post-Endgame, when the Sokovia Accords were instituted, everyone kind of turned on the Avengers because they don't really know what happened. But when the snap happened, everyone dusted away, and all they really know is that Iron Man Tony Stark made a sacrifice to bring everyone back. <laughs> So I would say the public would rally around someone like Iron Man, whereas uh, people like Captain America, Bucky, they aren't the heroes they once were anymore. They were from a different era. And uh, I, I think people would be like, no, let's just register all these guys so we can organize. But I think the caveat is Marvel could do a Civil War 2.0 over a different debate. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. I mentioned genetic lineage, like maybe Deviant linked people on one side, Eternals linked on another, like scrolls are derived from the Deviants. That could be a big thing that could draw in everyone, no matter what planet they're on in the MCU. But that's speculative. That should maybe be a different movie. You could have secret wars come in that divide people. If you're talking about what is the classic Marvel Civil War, it's over superhero registration. We'll save those other ideas for a future Rogue Theory episode. Yes. But Tommy, my question for you is, do you think Marvel should reboot the Civil War event in a different reality? Or should they do it over a different issue? What, what do you think? I think, well, in the movies, the cleanest way to kind of pay homage to the fact that they have these new characters would be in like a uh, multiverse of madness to just briefly show us five minutes of the civil war in a different dimension oh. show the show the airplane airport scene battle again but have x-men in there holy shit that's a great idea i think a full reboot of of the civil war as much as i love that comic i had the physical the actual main run of it then i also have all this what ifs and the the companion like what what were the fantastic four doing like the specific what everyone was doing the side comics i when i was younger i read every single one of those but yeah i just feel like it was such a huge undertaking to make that captain america civil war movie like to reboot sure. it now would just be like i don't it kind of undercuts the impact of that movie which i thought was a great movie i would hesitate to do that i would more make nods to the comic line and the newly acquired characters that they have the ip for now totally agree i i think there is a, a way that you can still deliver on that kind of fan service by having x-men fighting avengers or mm -hmm. avengers versus dark avengers like there's still a way you yeah. can have fights between superheroes by just coming up with a new title and uh civil war is obviously a huge event yeah. we wanted it to be more than it was but we can just tell new stories that, that deliver yeah. that kind of thing well tommy i'm gonna let you finish in a second just want to take a moment to remind everyone watching that new rock stars has been trying our best to keep these daily doses of distraction coming your way during this period, but it has not been easy. YouTube isn't exactly compensating us very fairly, regardless of what kind of views we get, which is insane. Our government loan requests are not being responded to. Our plan to try to get through this is to partner with another small business trying to help us all, a small business called Sanitize and Chill. So Sanitize and Chill combines hospital-grade ethanol-based hand sanitizer with CBD. And uh, don't worry, we have been making sure this product is actually effective at killing viruses. We're working very closely with the company. We're getting some medical professionals to make sure it meets the highest levels of guidelines. So here's the deal. There's no THC in this stuff, so you're not going to get high using it. But your hands will get clean. And it's green because it contains aloe vera to keep your hands smooth. And aloe vera is amazing. Every bottle of this has 100 milligrams of CBD. And alcohol content on the sanitizer is above the 60% level threshold that the CDC recommends for inactivating viruses and the other labels that you're familiar with. This is 70% alcohol. It's stronger than those brands that we took for granted that we can't really find on the shelves and are crazily marked up on online retailers. There is a limited supply of less than 2,500 bottles because of the small size of the company and the quality of this stuff. So if you are looking for hand sanitizer and you want to try to help us out, act now. Go to bit.ly.com slash nrchill and use the code newrockstars10 at checkout for 10% off your order. All right, we're going to move on to a bite-sized question that Tommy has done the research and he's the expert on this, because last yes. time he was on the show, he knew all about this subject. You got Tommy. It. Yes. Which non-human Marvel characters poop? Yes. And I'm going to give you five that I'm most <laughs> curious about. Yes. Hulk, yes. Thanos, Groot, <laughs> Nebula, and Vision. Huh? Do they Well, they say everybody poops, Eric. The <laughs> books say that. But uh, that's not true. I did some research here, and I uh, I have some theories. Let's let's go. Let's tick them off one by one. Hulk. Okay. Okay. Hulk definitely poops. First of all, I'm just gonna spoiler alert. We in Endgame, he's eating. I think he's, or eating, he's, he's eating. yeah, he's eating breakfast food, and then later yeah. he eats Ben and Jerry's ice cream. He's constantly yeah, eating. He's everything. eating. So I'm sorry, it doesn't just go away. That has to come out. <laughs> However, there is comic book precedence for this in the Marvel Zombie comic line zombie hulk eats so much human flesh 
that when he turns back into Bruce Banner, Bruce Banner has an excruciating stomach ache that he almost <laughs> dies from. So oh, no. the answer is the Hulk takes massive dumps, but it's better if he dumps as Hulk. Because unlike Ant-Man, who it's just the distance between atoms when he shrinks and, and expands, so uh, everything sh- shrinks and expands on a molecular uh-huh. level... The Hulk is gaining muscle mass and gaining tissue and, and everything, but he's the the mass of what he eats remains the same when he goes down to Bruce Banner size. So he has to be very careful. Yeah. If Hulk doesn't take Hulk dumps, if Banner takes a Hulk dump, he's going to the emergency room. That's a good point. In the, in the comics, it's rare that we see Hulk actually eating because he's usually just too mad to focus on sitting down and, and eating a taco. Exactly. But yeah, in the MCU, that guy consumes quite a bit. <laughs> so where does it go? All right, so next we'll go Vision. This is a pretty easy one. Vision is made of vibration and synthetic tissue much like superman he's powered by the sun he's solar powered so he does not need to eat or drink he does not need to poop he doesn't eat anything he simply needs to charge up like a solar battery however his powers when he's on planets that have different suns if there's like there, there's a comic book storyline where he goes to a planet that has like a negative sun and it makes him weak and he becomes almost depowered so he does not poop to answer that question. And I guess that makes sense. In the MCU, he makes the pepper cash, but he doesn't know, he doesn't taste it. He doesn't really understand uh, digestion or consumption. So, yeah. Yes. Now, Groot is a, is a <laughs> tough one because he does, in the comics, it's established that he does, like all plants, use photosynthesis and, and uh-huh. the waste product is oxygen, which is really candy for us Terrans. However, in a draft of Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the only line that made it in was Drax saying, I have famously huge turds. But there's another line before that that is Peter Quill telling Groot when he's baby Groot that he has to start aiming for the box, implying that he's excreting some sort of waste. And Uh this isn't necessarily poop, but when they jump through hyperspace, Groot vomits, implying that he has something in his stomach. So there is precedent that Groot maybe poops and excretes oxygen and uses photosynthesis, which that's just too much going on. I mean, like, for me, uh, that would just be, that's a long weekend. Yeah. Oh, boy. Nebula. Nebula poops, but very infrequently. Okay, so okay. Nebula has, again, we have to kind of do, if this is true, then this is also true. We don't really have uh-huh. a lot of cinematic or literative uh, proof of Nebula taking a dump, which, God, if you're out there and you're an artist, get to work on that because I'll pay <laughs> top dollar. But uh, she does eat. She requests uh, raw vegetables in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. She also mentions being hungry to Tony Stark. However, when her and Tony Stark are kind of shipwrecked, if you will, on their spaceship, Tony is wasting away and she is not really showing as much physical trauma. So it it suggests that her digestive system moves much slower her her heart probably beats much slower everything probably just moves at such a slower calmer level which is why you know she's able to live longer and and just and withstand more traumatic uh physical circumstances so i would say that nebula definitely takes a dump every once in a while but it's just very precise it's very precision and that's why we never see it she's got a secret bathroom somewhere she's very even know she's gone she comes back and you're like oh she must have had to go do something mail a letter or something last but not least big daddy thanos big daddy than than mr thickness he absolutely 100 percent takes dumps he loves to eat he has an anus as we know from the thanus theory people (laughs) such as neil degrasse tyson have weighed in on this and neil actually believes due to thanos's high stress and and rancid personality that his bowel movements would be extremely pungent and unpleasant i guess there's some sort of science linking people that are evil to having evil bowel movements or having uh, particularly (laughs) unpleasant bowel movements so oh my god and if you remember in endgame again this is one of those if this is true then this was true thanos is harvesting Harvesting those gourds when he's out in the fields, like, I don't know, unless he's making, you know, like, woodwind instruments or or decoration, I assume he's making them for food, right? Yeah, we've done that on Big Question before, what was Thanos cooking, and I think we concluded it's some kind of, like, butternut squash stew or Gorgeous. Maybe a borscht. (laughs) Maybe maybe a borscht. Maybe some sort of gourd gazpacho. But either way, if something comes in, it's got to come out. We learned that day one of human camp, so... (laughs) I think Thanos definitely poops, and I think it definitely smells, and he definitely doesn't use any spray. He just walks out, lets you marinate in, and if you're the next one in, I bet people have died <laughs> from Thanos' dumps. So, yeah, that's what I got for you. That's the straight straight talk for me. 
Tommy, I'm so relieved. Only you can answer these kind of questions. I don't know why you're so fascinated by them, Tommy. Maybe it's just we keep assigning them to you. <laughs> it's a passion of mine. What can I say? <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty spent, uh, yes. but I think we have time for one mailbag question. Let's Great. see here. The question is, what moment made you realize that you should never meet your heroes? Ooh. So, as uh, comedians, or, you know, as attempting to be comedians, we have our comedic heroes, and man, can that be a slippery slope. I had dinner with a comedian friend of mine who is very, very nice, and another friend of his, and we had dinner the three of us, for an hour and a half, and that person never looked at me, never talked to me. When my friend referenced me, that person ignored him. When I talked to that person, he ignored me. At the end of the night, I shook hands with my friend. I went to say goodbye to him. He reached out his hand apathetically like this to give me a fist bump. Still didn't say anything, and I have to say, that's why I'm not a fan. Not to name names. <laughs> you know, I interviewed for a job for yeah. And I found him to be very nice. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it was it was a friend who got me the interview, uh -huh. and uh, I didn't realize he would be in the room to interview me. Uh -huh. It was for like a researcher position, uh -huh. and I hadn't seen enough episodes. And they asked me what was my favorite bit from a recent season, uh -huh. and I couldn't. My mind went blank, and I mentioned something that was from season one. Uh, and it's like my biggest like yeah. me. What is wrong with me? And uh, and, I, and and also <laughs> let me make this is the caveat I give. To all celebrities and people who are in the public eye, everybody has a bad day. You have no idea what was going on with him. He might have just been broken up with. He might have gotten some bad career news. Maybe he just didn't want to talk to some, like, 23-year-old asshole who his friend dragged along to dinner. So, <laughs> looking at it from his point of view, maybe I was the monster that night. So, I... <laughs> Let's bring him on the show. Hear his side of the story. <laughs> By the way, I think he's absolutely hilarious. And I just did not have a good dinner with him. So but you never his, meet your heroes. Just bleep his name out. <laughs> Okay, my story, Tommy, I can't remember, you might have been here for this. Uh, so, viewers watching, Tommy and I were on multiple improv teams together at our old theater, IO West, RIP. Actually, RIP every improv theater now, because UCB yeah. just closed. Oh boy, uh, that's a sinking ship everywhere. Um, okay, but Tommy and I were on multiple teams, and one of the teams we were on was called The Cartel. It was a team with so many funny people, but just like, Tommy, I think you would agree, a lot of just like misconnections, like yes, people making moves was, past each like, other. It was a lot of very funny people who didn't want to play, play well with each other. <laughs> right, everyone wanted to do their own show. Yes. But you know what, I look back on that experience as only a fond moment. Like, me too, I, I, me too. And, I miss and, it and so much. And we get to perform a lot together, Eric. So like, of yes. that, you know, the people on that team that I performed well with, I still perform with, so. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, Cartel was one of these teams, like many teams at that theater at the time, just could not have a good show, just was not connecting. And it was so frustrating. I'm like, I know everyone on this team is super funny. We're just not connecting. Finally, we did have what I thought was like an A minus show. Mm -hmm. And it, we all got off stage, we're high five, and we're like, yes, we did it, we did it. I don't know if you were on the team at this time or if you were there for that show. But afterwards, we, we come down, we go out the back door of the theater. Our theater was known to produce some relatively famous alumni. Mm -hmm. And there was one actor who took classes at our theater who went on to become a very famous TV actor, Emmy Award winning sitcom actor. Tommy, I'm gonna tell you his name. Were yes. you there for this? I was not there for that show, but I know this story. For okay, me. yes. <laughs> so this guy randomly shows up on this sidewalk, and this is like a, a back alley sidewalk that most of the time it's just homeless people and, and crazy tourists. So to see this famous <laughs> Emmy Award winning hilarious actor come up to us, he goes, guys, guys, I just saw your show. Do you mind if I give you some notes? <laughs> Normally, the process of giving an improv team notes is reserved for the coach of that team. The team invites like a, an expert, a veteran, to sit in on mm -hmm. their show, give them notes afterwards. Mm -hmm. But someone like this guy, we're like, sure, yeah. give us all the notes you want. He was sweating bullets, uh, beat red, seemed kind of <laughs> nuts, and he was giving us the worst notes ever. We had a great show, yeah. but he uh, like he clearly was out of the loop. 
hadn't yeah. taken an improv class in years, yeah. was giving us like these old school level one notes that did not apply to our show. Like most of the time you take the note, but all of us are looking at each other. We're like, this guy's full of shit. Right. But because he's famous, we're going to take the notes. Um, but I was just flattered that he that he watched our show. Right. This is why I didn't want to meet my hero. Afterwards, we we went back to the bar. I went to go watch a couple more shows. I had a friend from out of town who had just moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. And she was hanging out in the bar. And he made some very, very inappropriate passes to her. Uh, and said some very disgusting things to her. Uh, and that's why I'm not saying his name. Yes. Because I'm waiting for his name to come out right now mm -hmm. in, in this era. I, yeah. I don't know, it might have just been a bad night. It might have yeah. just been an isolated incident. There might have been others. That's the kind of behavior that you hear from people like, oh, that's never okay in any circumstance. It's probably someone who did that kind of thing because they knew they could get away with it because they're right. an Emmy winner. So it broke my heart a and little a bit. a very nice public face. You know what I mean? A person yeah, that, you would never that, suspect it from this person. I think that sometimes those, that gives people a little more leeway in that department because it can be like, oh, he's so nice. Like you would never. Oh, he's so nice. Who, him? Really? Never yes. meet your heroes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, the reason I remember this is like it was the cartel's one great show yeah, that we did. Sure, like that team what existed for like five years had the yeah. most rotating oh, uh, people performers, here, co coaches, performers. Like, yeah, yeah, everyone was on the cartel at some point, mm -hmm. and then it could just never connect. And finally, it happened, and it was the same night that this weird ass incident happened. Yikes! Uh, and I'll never forget it. Oof, never meet yep. your heroes. Never meet Don't, your heroes. Amen. Never ever meet your heroes. <laughs> And that's the lesson from Civil War. Yes. These, these heroes are people. <laughs> they shouldn't meet each other. <laughs> yeah. They <laughs> know what to be. <laughs> well, that is our show. Tommy, yes. thanks so much for doing this with me this week. It was so great to have you Eric, on. Thank you for having me. As always, it's a joy to talk to you, and I miss you. I miss you too, buddy. Soon, sooner or later, we'll be back doing an improv show, having uh, Emmy winners uh, sexually harass our team. Absolutely. We'll be opening up doorways for serial harassers to run rampant on our female friends ain't that america oh god uh, <laughs> cut that out. please cut that uh, out. ain't that america <laughs> <laughs> all right hey. go bills <laughs> <laughs> hey, a reminder that you can join our official Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. That's where we usually see these questions first. We have a whole channel just to submit questions. Uh, you can, of course, tweet at us questions. You can comment in this video. But the best way to get these questions directly on our desk in front of us is by joining our Discord server. Uh, also, you can get an audio version of the show by subscribing to the New Rockstars Big Question podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions this episode. You can also mail us your questions uh, by mailing it to our P.O. Box address here. You can follow me, Eddie A. Boss. Follow Tommy at Tommy Bechtold on uh, uh, all social media. And of course, follow New Rockstars on social. Subscribe here on YouTube to get too much information on all the stuff you care about. Tommy, what are you trying to plug here? Uh, this is my new book, The Christmas Donkey. Uh, <laughs> it's a little golden book, and uh, you can buy it in stores anywhere. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas. That's when this is airing, right? Yeah, yes. Who knows? <laughs> all right, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye, Bye Eric.